Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is John Carter. That's correct. And you've had a near-death experience you're gonna tell us about today. Yes, um, I, uh, I'd be glad to tell you about it because it's something that's changed my life, literally. Um, I, uh, it, well, 2020 wasn't a very good year for a lot of us, including me. And uh, in August of 2020, I uh, collapsed in my home from sepsis poisoning. Um, and uh, I wasn't found for five days. And when they did find me, uh, my organs were starting to fail. So they rushed me to ICU at the local hospital here. And um, it was there that I died twice uh, from what the doctors told me, but they brought me back both times. Um, and let me just say that um, what I'm about to tell you was very, very real. This was not a delusion in any way. I know the difference between a delusion and a dream and, and um, something that's very real. And uh, what happened to me, um, I was able to look down on myself, my body there on the uh, gurney it, or the bed that I was laying in. And the doctor and the nurse was, it was chaos in the room, but they knew it. I could tell they knew what they were doing. Does that make any sense? Yeah. And um, the nurse was putting a needle in my arm and the doctor had the paddles and he had the other nurses stand back and then he hit me in the chest. Um, and <laughs> while he was doing this, I was... I, this is the best way to explain it. I was sucked into like a hole. Uh, uh, but the hole was like a big spiral type hole. And inside that spiral, I started to float towards a distant light. And inside that spiral, I started to see my life from the age of about two to three years old all the wonderful things in my life started appearing on the sides of this spiral wall. And I'm going through and I'm seeing things that I've never seen before, but were things that made me very happy when I was three, four, five years old, things that I could not remember uh, before. And I've since verified many of those things with my older sister, but anyway, as I was traveling through this tunnel, I'm um, slowly starting to feel really uh, hot and, and sweaty. And I, I just felt strained. My body or soul, I guess you could say, felt really strained. And I didn't, as I moved through, I still was seeing pleasurable moments throughout my ch childhood history from the ages of three, like I said, through uh, 14, 15, 16, and as I moved into my adulthood, and then on to, um, and I'm seeing this, it's like a big round video screen I'm seeing this on, and I'm traveling, and it feels like um, I'm being pulled towards this light. Um, finally, I get to the point where uh, I'm at um, 61, 62, uh, well, in this case, it was 60, 61, and uh, I, uh, all of a sudden, it's like somebody pulled this huge veil back, like, a, have you ever been to a theater and watched the veil come pulling back real fast? Like the That's curtain? The way it, yes, the curtain got pulled back, and I was, uh, I was laying on my back in what appeared to be um, a strange type dirt. Um, and I, I wasn't feeling good at all, my soul. I, I, but somebody had me in their arms. Um, and 
it was that person's left arm. And I was looking up at a sky that I had never seen before. Um, I've never seen colors like that before, Peggy, ever. Um, I'm an artist, you know, amateur, of course, but an artist. And there's no way that I could make those colors in this realm from what I saw in that realm. Those colors are completely unique to that, to that space or, or realm. Um, and as this person was holding me, he had a, a large spoon in his hand and a wooden bucket. And um, the wooden bucket was fairly good sized and the spoon was fairly good sized. And he dipped the spoon in the bucket. And, he, and I, again, I want to emphasize that my soul was thirsting. I guess the only way to explain it. And he said, he put it up to my lips and he said, in the name of my father. And he poured water down my throat and it was so refreshing. Oh. I mean, so refreshing. I mean, I just, I just, I can't even explain how refreshing it was. It's beautiful. It, and it, it was dribbling down my chin and on my chest. And all of a sudden I started feeling a lot better. I mean, a lot better. And then he said, he said, well, for initially he said, in the name of my father. And then he said, in the name of the son. And he poured another one down my throat. Now I'm really feeling good. Okay. And he dips it in again, and he poured it over my head this time. And he said, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And it was at that point, I felt something go through my entire body or soul. Um, I felt changed completely. I felt, I, I've explained it this way to people. You ever seen that show on Christmas time? where the Grinch's heart grew 50 times yeah. its size. That's exactly what I felt, that right there, where the my heart grew 50 times its size. And I turned to look at this person, and I could smell the mud and everything and could touch it and everything. And he lifted me up, and I looked at him, and it was Jesus. It was Jesus. And I said, I looked at him like, whoa, his eyes met mine. I mean, he was looking directly into my eyes and I could see so much love and compassion in his face. And he smiled and he said, John, it's not your time yet. He said, I want you, he said, I'm going to prepare a mansion for you and for all your family and friends. He said, but I'm telling you, it's not your time yet. I'm going to have to send you back. And he, he lifted me up and, you know, he, he, he looked like the Jesus that many of us would conjure up in our heads. And since then, I've looked and looked and looked for, for through pictures, historical <coughs> pictures, because I'm a historian. Um, and I've got a major in history. So I've looked all through the, you know, years of, and I finally found his face, the correct one. So that's kind of cool. But anyway. Um, he wasn't wearing anything except a tunic. That was, I guess the best way to say it is like a, um, it, it smelled like a potato sack, if that makes any sense. Huh. Um, I mean, it didn't smell stink or anything, but it was that consistency, that tunic he had, that he was holding me with, huh. that he had on. And he had a rope around his, just a simple rope around his waist, and he had sandals on. And he went on to say, because I, I looked to my left and I couldn't help but notice something that I've never seen before. And it completely blew me away. There's this angel standing there with giant white wings, the most glorious wings you've ever seen. I've never seen anything like that. And the angel has a breastplate and, 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 his ankles had armor on them and he had a sword on his hip and he had the most gorgeous blonde hair it was it was probably shoulder length 
and he's smiling at me. And I said, Jesus, I said, man, I said, who is that? And he said, that's Michael. He said, that's my archangel. He said, he brought you here. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I smiled back at him, but I mean, it took me aback. Yeah. And I said, Jesus, is this heaven? And he said, yes, it is. And he said, I said, but Jesus, I said, why are you speaking to me? I said, I'm a sinner. I don't belong here. I said, if anything, I belong in the neither regions. And he said, you do belong here, John. And he says to me, he says, John, he says, I want you to know that the last will be first and the first shall be last. Now, I've tried to look up the meaning of all of that, but it took me aback. And I said, Jesus, you don't understand. I, I'm not worthy to be, even be in your presence. You know, I, I mean, I, I you know, I, I was, I didn't lead a great life, to be honest with you. And I even had a little shred of doubt that you even existed. And he said, John, he said, you know now that I indeed exist. He said, there's no more room for doubt. And he said, Beautiful. walk with me. And he started to walk with me. And Peggy, in front of me, there was this giant field, the most gorgeous field I had ever seen with rolling hills. And there were thousands. And I, I don't want to underestimate how many people were there, but there were thousands of people there in that field. And they were all talking and laughing and smiling and very happy. And he walks me up to the first row of folks. And it turns out to be my family, my dad, my mom, all my aunts, brothers, sisters that have, um, you know, not brothers and sisters of my family, but brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, that I knew here on earth that had passed on. And that there was also, there was also uh, my niece who had had a diabetic coma when she was nine years old and she was there and she was in the right arm of my mom. And, you know, my dad, he was kind of a jokester when he was here on earth. And I said, dad, you know, I can't believe it, you know? And he said, I he said, how you doing son? And he reached out his hand and pulled me into him and gave me a big hug. And he said, how are you? You know, and I said, dad, how are you? And he said, pretty good for an old fella. That's what he used to say here on earth. <laughs> and then my mom, she said, oh, Johnny. And she gave me a big <laughs> hug, a kiss. And I was just taken aback. I was like, oh, my God, this is like a, a family reunion in heaven. And my niece, she said, hi, Uncle Johnny. And she was just as innocent as ever. And she was a little angel. And. She, you know, I, I was dumbfounded, to be honest with you. I, I look back on this and I think to myself, my God, you know, this was the most amazing experience. I mean, my aunts, uncles were up there, um, cousins that had passed on. I ran into my cousin, John Carter, who was my first cousin who lived out in California. And I ran into him and he said, John, do you remember me? And I said, sure, I do. And he gave me the biggest hug. And he said, you remember how our dads used to say, hey, John, and we both turn our heads. <laughs> and I said, sure. <laughs> and he laughed. And uh, and there were people that I'd never met before, but I had seen pictures of from friends, like mothers and fathers of close friends. And they were up there and they thanked me and gave me hugs for protecting their children while I was on earth. Well, the deeper I got into the crowd, the more time went back. In other words, I was seeing people that were dressed much differently. And I guess in heaven, you can be whatever age you want because my mom was looked like she was maybe in her 50s or 60s. My dad looked like he was maybe in his early 60s. 
um, as well. And all my aunts and uncles looked like they were maybe in their 50s and 60s. But my, I, this fella comes walking up to me and he had a, a suit on that was from the 1800s. Um, looked like something that you would never wear today, obviously. And he had a medal around his neck. And he smiled at me and he said, you don't know me, do you, John? I said, no, I don't. I said, who are you? He said, I'm your great, great, great grandfather. And I was like, okay. And he said, yeah. He, and I said, that's a cool medal. I, Cause it, I kept looking at it, you know? And he said, that's the victory medal. And I said, victory medal. And he said that, he said, I won that in the civil war. So it must've been something very precious to him. Oh. And I kept going into the crowd and the deeper I got into the crowd, the, uh, the more people I saw that I had no idea who they were, but they were relation, family related. Everybody up there apparently was either friends or family relation of, of friends that I had never been around before, but they were also friendly, giving me hugs, patting me on the back, making me feel at home, um, being so kind and so loving to me. And it, it, just made me feel so good and it's the only way I can explain it is is that I felt such a joy in my heart and I still do today I feel this joy in my heart and I'm walking and I'm listening to these folks and there's even this guy that's pushing this cart with a bunch of wrapped sausages and he's dressed like they did in the European like 14 or 1500s <laughs> and I smell the sausages it was a smell of um whoops I'm sorry, got a phone, had a phone call coming in. Oh, okay. There was a smell of uh, unbelievable, I guess the only way to say it is uh, the, the real, you know, it was a pungent smell. That's the word I'm looking for, of sausage. And he kept trying to give me a sausage. He was speaking in a foreign language I didn't understand. <laughs> uh, I, I, I didn't understand. Sounded like maybe Czechoslovakian or, or maybe Hungarian or something of that nature. But he was trying to give me this sausage. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, I can't. I said, but he reached out and gave me a hug anyway. I mean, this is what I'm feeling up there. I'm feeling nothing but love. I look in the distance and there's a guy with like a bucket helmet on. And he's got that cross across it. And he's got a white vestment on. And he's got a red cross across it. And I asked, uh, I was walking and I, I, I looked and I, you know, I, I, when I got back from heaven, I asked my sister, I said, you know, who is that? And, you know, I wonder what that person was from. And she said he probably was a crusader or something that was in our family, you know. And I was seeing the guys that were dressed as, uh, you see them around the, the Pope. They had to dress like Swiss guards. They had those Spanish looking hats on and the puffy pants. Uh, and they had, uh, and anyway, I, I'm walking and Jesus turns me around and he says, John, I'm going to send you back. He said, I know you've been meeting a lot of people up here. And he said, I want you to know that I'm going to be bringing you and a lot of other people back up here. He said, but right now, what I want you to do is go back and tell people something. He said, I'm sending you on a mission. And he said, I'm sending you back to tell everyone to love one another and take care of one another and to love one another as I love them. That's the best way to be. And or that's the best way I can explain. That's what he exactly the words that he said, love one another the same way I love them. And I was taken aback, but my heart felt like it was going to, or my soul felt like it was going to explode. I mean, it felt like um, just overflowing with love. And 
I uh, it kind of shook me up a little bit, but um, every time I touch his robe or touch his hand, he it just felt so unbelievable. And the I can't explain again the colors of the flowers that were in that field and the rolling hills and the, the uh, shining in the distance and the light and the grandeur, and really grandeur doesn't even do it justice, of the sky and the colors that I was seeing. Um, I've seen colors very similar to that with the, with, from Hubble, you know, the space telescope. But some of those colors, it just doesn't match up. Some of them are I've never seen before. Some of those colors, I've never seen those colors before. I've just never seen it. And uh, well, anyway, after about what seemed like hours of meeting people, I finally got tired and I laid back down in the field. And when I woke up, I was back in ICU and they had a thing in my mouth it was helping me breathe, but I had, I was semi-conscious. I guess that's the best way to put it. All I could do was move my eyes. And I looked over and I saw my daughter with a mask on looking through a window watching me. And she was crying. And I gave her a thumbs up and she smiled. I could tell underneath her mask, she smiled. And then I knew that I was going to be okay. And they subsequently sent me to, um, now this is what's amazing. They subsequently sent me to several different facilities because of COVID. They couldn't keep me there. So they sent me to a hospital up in Portage, Indiana. And it was there that I had a doctor for every organ, respiratory, liver, kidneys, Right down, even gallbladder, I had doctors for. And they all started, went to work on me. And I, they put a pick line in me here with about five different, and I had to have kidney dialysis and all kinds of stuff because my kidneys were failing. I said earlier that my organs were failing. My heart, they gave me five echocardiograms. Um, and then on the last one, they found out that my aorta was damaged. And then it was bad or going bad. And if I didn't get it changed out, I was going to have a heart attack. So once they got my, all my other organs stabilized and my liver where they would funk or my liver and my kidneys where they would function on their own, you know, independently without having dialysis or anything, then they said, okay, we're going to send you down to Indianapolis University Methodist in Indianapolis. And they shipped me down there. It was there. I had open heart surgery. And uh, they put in a new aorta on my heart. And it was a cow's aorta. So I tell people to eat a lot of chicken now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I have a strong urge to graze in the front yard. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, I joke around about it. But uh, I definitely... Um, it gave me a new lease on life. And so they sent me up to a rehab place and it was there that they gave me, guess what? Up here close to home, they gave me COVID. So they sent me, I mean, I started to get really bad at double pneumonia. So they sent yeah. me back to, yeah. So they sent me back to Indianapolis university Methodist, um, and I was in ICU, COVID ICU. And this was in December of, uh, that's how much time it progressed. This was in December of 2020. And there were people dying all around me, Peggy. I mean, it was scary. It was a real wake up call. And everybody was walking around in these strange looking moon suits. And it kind of made you feel like a second class citizen. But I had so much love in my heart that I didn't care who I met. They could be nasty to me all they wanted. I just smiled and told them I love them. Oh, you know, and you did what was, you were told we, to do. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to do. I was told, I was telling everybody, you know, about 
my NDE, the doctors, everybody. And they would even hold my hand and pray with me, Aww. which was nice. It was Beautiful. really sweet. And uh, a priest came to see me and blessed me and gave, put oil on my head and, and blessed me and, and gave me communion. And, and uh, that felt great. But also, I, I was amazed because I, I want to point something out. When I was in heaven, it wasn't just Catholics up there. It was people that I knew here on earth. That's funny. <laughs> wasn't it just was Catholics like, up there. I like that. <laughs> no, it wasn't just Catholics. There were people from every type of religion you could think of in heaven. Sorry, I had another phone call. Uh, but there were people up there from every thing you could imagine. Uh, every religion especially Christian religions that you could imagine. Okay. I mean, I didn't see any Muslims or, or, uh, you know, and that's no slight on them, but um, I, I didn't see anybody that, of course I was only with family members. Yeah. You know, that had passed on. So there you go. But uh, there were a lot of people in my family that were not Catholic, but they were up there. And uh, so I want to make that point clear that, uh, I don't think Jesus discriminates a whole lot when it comes to, <laughs> to your beliefs. But um, what what he did do is he had everybody, everybody that was up there was smiling, loving one another, hugging one another, joking with one another, being kind to one another. And, and, and it was a place of utter joy and contentment. That's the best way to explain it. And I was trying to spread that here, and I've been doing that ever since I got back. I've been trying to teach people to love one another, to raise each other up, and to make each other feel comfortable with one another. So that because Jesus told me, he said, there's too much hate in the world. He said, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. He said, I want people to learn to love one another. You know, and we are a divided nation, and I'm glad that he told me that because it taught me a hard lesson. And that was, you know, I had some really strong political beliefs before all of this happened. When I got back, I realized not, none of that really matters that much. What matters is, is that you love one another and that you be kind to one another, you know, and that love is unconditional and it comes from God, you know, and, and, I've been trying to teach people that it's not right to, to try and, I mean, wars and, and, and the things that people are threatening with here on earth, they really shouldn't do that stuff. They should learn to love one another. They should learn to love their fellow man. And if everybody did that, what a world we would live in. Have you thought about or have you looked into your genealogy to find this guy that was in the Civil War? Yes, yes. In fact, before I died, um, my daughter did some, or excuse me, my sister did some genealogy. And I should point out when I was in heaven, she's had two sons cross into heaven and a husband as well. Uh, my sister has. And they were all together right there in heaven. And I got a chance to see them. And that was magical. Because, I bet that was nice for her to tell her. Oh, yeah, I told her and she was very pleased. But I, they had a message for her and that was, don't be upset. We're waiting for you and everything's fine. We're very happy. And I even explained to her what they were wearing and, and uh, you know, and, and Bob, her, her late husband, was a very close friend of mine when he was here on earth. And... Uh, to see him after 30 or 40 years was really amazing. And uh, it, I, I look back on all of these experiences up there and, and I thought, man, you know, and, and to be honest with you, Peggy, I don't know if there's another realm out there, you know, like <coughs> some people believe in, some people believe in purgatory. Some people believe in um, like Catholics do. Some people believe in, in hell. I didn't see any of that stuff, but that's not yeah. to say that it doesn't exist. Okay. Um, because obviously it's very obvious that evil 
does exist. Yeah. But I'm here to do everything in my power to change that, yeah. to make everybody understand the importance of love and the importance of loving their fellow man. You know, if you walk into a, a very pitch black, have you ever been in a room, Peggy, that's pitch black? Mm -hmm. You can't see three feet in front of your face. Right. If you light a match, what happens? You see a little bit. You see a little bit, but that light chases the darkness in every direction. And that's the light of Christ. And that's the goodness and love that he emits. Makes me think of that and, little kid's song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. <laughs> that's exactly right. There's a lot of truth to that song. Mm -hmm. And all the darkness, which is evil, heads for corners and gets out of there because good always conquers evil and love always conquers evil no matter what you know i had even when i was getting well i ran into nurses that were having a bad day and they would really get nasty with me and sometimes and I, it's not because i wasn't you know uh, doing things that they wanted me to do I, they just were having a bad day and I could pick up on that. We all but get in the darkness them, sometimes. Yeah. And I told them, I said, look, no matter how bad your day is, you need to know that Jesus loves you. And so do I, and, and things are going to get better. And you're a great nurse, you know, and their, their faces would be like, it would like, I could see the light of Christ just light them up, <laughs> you know? And that's what we need to do. We need to spread that love to each and every person that we run into. Yeah, it's hard to stop if someone's being nasty and take their hand and, are you having a bad day? Instead right. of, well, you, Biddy, I'm going to tell your supervisor and <laughs> get you fired. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, you know, even the, even, and I did run into a lot of people that were uncaring, so to speak. Um, I was in a, they put me in a, after I had, obtained COVID, they put me in a really bad nursing home because it was the only place that was taking people with COVID at that time. And at uh, 60. Yeah. Can you imagine? I, yeah. I, my, I asked my doctor when I got back, I, uh, my personal physician, when I finally got home, um, I asked her, I said, I went to the doctor and I, she said, I didn't think you were going to make it. She said, people your age were dying. And she's right. I was down there and people were dying all around me. They, they were the uh, blue light go off and I would see the same thing that happened to me when I had the sepsis. They would, they would put the needle in the arm and they would do chest compressions on them. And they had this thing that they put over their mouth and squeeze this like balloon thing to try and get their breath going. And uh, a lot of people, they'd call it. I'd see the doctor look at his watch and call the death. And then, and I asked the nurse, I said, you know, because it's kind of scary when you see yeah. that. Real scary, actually. Yeah. And I asked, I asked the nurse, I said, what are they doing with all these bodies? And he said, they've had to bring in two refrigeration trucks just to hold all the bodies. He said, and I, that really took me aback. Yeah. But they wanted to intubate me. And I noticed that everybody they did that to, It'd be maybe three or four days later and they'd be dead. And I said, no, 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 no. You're not going to do that to me. I said, give me remdesivir. You know, and, and the doctor said, we can try that. And so they started giving me remdesivir. Well, slowly but surely, this stuff started to come up from my lungs. And with a lot of prayer and a lot of thinking on what had happened to me in this NDE, Jesus healed me. What's that medicine called? Remdesivir. Remdesivir. Right. It was the same wow. stuff that President Trump and Melania took. Uh, they gave that to them and they healed like in two weeks from COVID. And it brings up the... It brings up all the garbage from your lungs. Did with me anyway. And they gave me a suction tube. And that would suck all the garbage from my lungs, you know, right down it. And uh, it, within two weeks, I was asymptomatic, which means wow. I had no temperature. My oxygen was fine. I mean, they still had me on oxygen, 
but my oxygen was getting much better and that my heart rate, I had a no arrhythmia or anything like that. My heart was fine. Um, you know, they had the cardiologist come in, kidney doctor come in, everybody checking on me, checking on my blood. They took blood work every single day. And that got to be kind of tiresome, but that's okay. I didn't mind because I knew I had a mission to do. I knew when I got out of there that I had to go to therapy for a couple months and learn how to walk again. Believe it or not, I had been in the hospital that long. I had lost all my muscle mass in my arms and legs. So they had to put me in a Hoyer lift just to get me around and put me in a wheelchair. And uh, I had to go to a gym when I finally got in rehab and learn how to walk and do all the things that uh, a lot of people do to get well. And I did. And I was, they said I was the model student because I, they would ask me to do 20 or 30 reps and I do 40, you know, on a machine or whatever, because I wanted to get well and I wanted to go home. That was my goal. And I had real, I really, really pressed myself to do that. And uh, finally, the first week of April, my future son-in-law came and got me and picked me up. And, you know, I had all my stuff with me and uh, he drove me home and I was still a little shaky, of course, and still had to do a lot of rehab, but that was, I could do enough walking with a walker and so forth to where I could, I could get around the house and do things for myself. And I've been doing that ever since and working out on the treadmill and working out on the bike and trying to get myself healed as fast as I can. But I feel a lot better now. Good. And now I'm spreading this mission that I'm on, I guess you could say. Or Well, I am or, so uh, proud to have you on to help spread that. You have a beautiful, detailed, heavenly story. to And it, being uh, told what to come back and tell us and that he sends people back is amazing. I'm so honored to have you on. Well, thank you. I, I, that's very kind of you. You have a sweetheart. I could tell. I, oh, I, I, I can, mean it. I, I very much mean that. Well, I'm just being what I, the Holy Spirit now, when he poured that water over my head, I mean, it really flows through me. And I can, I've told people things that I don't even know where I got this information from. It came off the top of my head but it was the Holy Spirit. I had one person, they, they wanted me to uh, explain to them how Jesus exists. How can Jesus exist? And because they didn't believe, you know, and that's okay. You know, I told them, I love you. I understand. I said, but let me ask you one question. And they said, sure. And I said, 2000 and plus years ago, how many poor carpenters do you think lived in Judea? And he says, uh, well, I don't know. He said, maybe four or 500. And I said, that's probably a good guess. I said, now, how is it that one of those poor carpenters has changed the entire face of humanity? I said, how can that be? Now, I don't know where I got that information from, Peg. And <laughs> all over the world of all religions... The most seen person in heaven is Jesus. Yeah. Well, I don't know where I got that information most, from. You know, relig most seen religious figure, you know, because only a small percentage actually has a religious figure experience. And I'm in that right. category as well, because I was with God and Jesus as well. And so we were in a small category of people that actually saw them. But of the people in that category that actually sees a religious figure across the globe of all faiths, the most viewed testimony that they saw right. was Jesus. And that makes sense. I, I, I can only go from what I know on a personal level, obviously, and you too. But um, I do know this. Um, I could even, I can bring you the picture of the person that I met because I have okay. that picture. You have with you, you know, now? I can, I can send that to you. Oh, okay. And because I found it. Yeah, and I was shocked. Me. I shocked. I was shocked that I even found it. But that was the person in heaven that I had met, and that did all of those things for me. And you know, the amazing thing is, 
is that when I could touch things up there, I could smell things up there. I could, there's, it was like I was there in person, but I wasn't, if that makes any sense. I had all five of my senses. Now you don't have that in a delusion. You just don't. You don't have all five of your senses. And to me, um, you know, I never used to talk this way before, and I never used to be this way. <laughs> and, and uh, I, you know, I was kind of hard-nosed and tough and before and, and uh, wasn't that big of a believer, so to speak. I made fun of a lot of people who were, I called them Bible thumpers or whatever the case may be. I, you know, I, I guess, uh, but that was the sinner in me. And Jesus, I told him, I said, look, I'm not worthy to be here in front of you. You know, I was so amazed that it was him. And that's a brave, you know, I, was, I, I was imagine most of us would be like, you don't see everything I did, do you? Like, I'm not going to tell you, <laughs> you know, we're like, <laughs> that's what I felt. I felt like I felt so guilty. I said, you know, there should be somebody up here as like a saint or something, not me. You know, I mean, and he said, John, the last shall be first. And the first shall be last. And I understand what he means now. Yeah. That uh, and you didn't get it right away. You were like, you still didn't. No, get it. I, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't get it right away. I was like, what, what is he talking about? But when I got back, I looked it up, you know, in the Bible. And it has, he said something like that in the Bible. Yeah. I can't quote it verse, but yeah, he it's did pretty say close. that. It's pretty close. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I never read, you know, I couldn't quote scripture before. Never in a million years could I do anything like that. But here I am, you know, here learning. Jesus is teaching me things that, you know, he had said previously when he was here on earth. And uh, so anyway, I told this person, you know, how can one person, Jesus, change the entire face of humanity? And he didn't have an answer for me. And he said, you know, you've got a point. And I planted that seed. And I said, well, what, if, you, if you do anything, at least go walk away with this. Love your neighbor and pray for those that don't like you, your enemies. And take care of those that may not like you or may despise you. Pray for them and be kind to them and lift them up. Because that's the message that's in my heart. And yeah, that's those the are the ones that need it. Exactly. And that's the message I want to send. I want to send it throughout the world. You know, I'd love to see Mr. Putin and sit down with him and explain to him, you know, you have 100,000 troops on the Ukrainian border. Why don't I get you and the Ukrainian leader together where you can hug each other and say, we're not going to threaten each other. We're going to love one another. Yeah. Or maybe get yes. the president of China and the president of Taiwan and do the same thing. I know that he's a communist and they don't believe in religion, but maybe I could turn his belief if I just told him that I loved him. Can you imagine if we really could succeed in proving the near-death experience proving that heaven does exist, that it is real. God, Jesus, angel of the heaven, that it's real. Can you imagine if we could prove it somehow and to well, get through to people, not that we want them to all now go to our church or subscribe oh to no. our, you know, beliefs. No, no. It's just, we're all going to die and you we're know, all going to find out. Why not know the truth right. now? I'm not afraid of death anymore. I'm not afraid of it at all. Because I know what's going to happen. I'm I've not afraid there. of my own death. I'm afraid of my families, you know, losing my family, not having my family, my husband. I'm afraid right. of that. I understand. But my own, you know, I'm not. And I know they'll right. be fine too, but I'm just going to be here without them. And I don't want that. It's, it's yeah, hard. Pega death isn't all fun. And, oh, because there's a heaven. This is great dying. No, people hurt and they mourn loss. Absolutely. What's left behind? My daughter, uh, or excuse me, my sister, whom I love very much, my older sister, she's lost two sons. And I can never wrap my head around that kind of loss. No. Never in a million years. 
You know, she's got three sons. One is a police officer. So I'm constantly praying for him. But she lost two other sons to, to you know, abuse. And it's so sad because they were such good people when they were here on earth. But they're in heaven now. And I'm so thankful that they're with their father who's in heaven and um, and they're with Jesus and all his angels and, and, you know, Gabriel and Raphael. And I never got a chance to see them. I, I'm sure they're as glorious as Michael was. And I'm sure but, it sounds like a fairy tale to people that it's just too good to be true. It's too good to believe. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. That's what I used to think. And uh, you know what? It is too good to true. be true. That's because the first when I was thing up you there, see on the other I, side. I, I, I is, wow, there, it's true. I saw these colors and these the sky was a different color and the the this beautiful hills that was different colors and flowers that were I'd never seen before. Things that but it, it smelled the smell of it and the sense of it and the love that I felt. I didn't want to leave Peg. And Jesus telling you, I've prepared a mansion for you and your family. I mean, that's in the Bible. I've prepared a yes. mansion for you. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't know that before, but I do now. I mean, how I can back. someone have a hallucination that is biblically correct? You know, and then like uh, your memories that you had in the tunnel that you didn't even remember and your sister confirmed. There's no way you could have known that. There's no way you could have hallucinated or had that dream or, you know, exactly. I, it's just not I, possible. I saw something that was very, apparently very special to me when I was three years old. Apparently my dad um, had bought me a, and it's, I'm watching this like it's on a TV screen. My dad had bought me a, one of these little push cars, metal push cars. We're talking about 1962 here. So, but it was a little metal push car that you pushed with your feet. And it was a regular automobile type cars, red and white. And uh, he put me in it. He picked me up and put me in it and showed me how to work the wheels. And, you know, I took off down the sidewalk. And, and uh, apparently that was a very pleasing experience for me at three years old. Well, I didn't remember that in a million years. And I asked my older sister, I said, did dad get me something like that or dad and mom and she, and mary ann said yes he did he sure did and i was like whoa you know yeah this we is get unreal. confirmations in our near-death experiences so when we come back we can have a confirmation that says wow this is real you know like evan there was a beautiful woman on a butterfly wing with him and his having experience and then later on he gets a picture of his biological sister because he was adopted as an infant and that was her you know, that right. was his confirmation. We have, you and I, you know, we have confirmations of our own through our near-death experiences when we sit back and we analyze them and critique it and want to know the truth because we don't want to be crazy. We don't want to be weird. We want to know. And then that right. th those confirmations are for us. Right. Well, another thing that I did, I should point out, is that um, I had a person ask me, um, you know, you Christians, you believe in the, the Trinity. And I said, yes, we do. And he said, how can three, you know, one plus one plus one equals three? It doesn't equal one. And uh, again, Peg, I don't know where I got this from. This just popped into my head. Like Jesus said, here, take this, you know, it was like a catching a football pass, I guess. It was equivalent to that, you know, I get and, scoring a and scoring a touchdown, you know, um, I took, I had a little drink. Okay. I had a Coke and I took one drop and I put it on the counter and I said one, and then a second drop and I put it on top of it two, and then the second, third drop. And I put it on top of it three. Well, then I had a little puddle there and I said, see, three can equal one. You know what I heard in my head when you said that person asked you that question. I wrote it down as you were explaining your explanation. God is the greatest mathematician. Yes. Yes. You know, somebody saying, how does that equal this? God is the greatest mathematician. Scientists are in awe and cannot understand how all these mathematical 
mathematical equations are in our DNA. It's in our sciences right. and everything. The greatest you know, mathematics of the world is all up in our universe and all in our bodies and everywhere. And then right. they want to ask, how could that be? <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, I was the same way, though. You know, I mean, I was very suspicious. We're ignorant. I, I was a very doubting Thomas. For a long time, I was a doubting Thomas. I had that, you know, I was brought up Catholic and I was an altar boy and I went through the motions and everything. But you know what? I didn't go back to church. I didn't do all those things. I was a dormant Catholic. You know, I, I, uh, I sinned, you know, for 40, oops, sorry. It's okay. Plus years I was sinning and, uh, doing all the things that I shouldn't have done. And, uh, that's why I asked Jesus, you know, why am I here? You know, but, uh, I, I now understand that who wins in the end. I now get it. I now know that goodness and love is what wins in the end. It's not evil. It's not, um, any of those things that those things are not going to they they run from good and evil goodness and and love you know evil just it 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 can't handle it and and i've ran into people i hate to say it that i think were demon possessed and i put my hand on them and i told them you know jesus loves you you know and they would stop and look into my eyes and i'd smile and they'd give me a big hug you know, after cussing me out or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of love that I'm talking about. That's the mm -hmm. kind of love that we need to spread. Jesus it makes me is Jesus's love. It makes me think of that case a few years ago. It was all over the news where a young man came in fully armored, loaded, you know, to do destruction to the school. And sure. um, the lady in the office just got talking to him. And she's, oh, I know how you're feeling. Let me tell you about my life and what I've been through. And and he right. first he wasn't phased. And then he started kind of listening. And he ended up laying everything down. And, you know, if we could treat the worst of people with that compassion, because we don't know what brought them to that point and what got them there. You know, they could have um, pain and misery that we couldn't even imagine. And they just at That's their right. breaking point. And all they need is that hand on their shoulder or a compassionate right. eye to sit down and say, or what is hug. going on? A hug goes a long way. Yeah. And you know what? I learned in heaven that hugs are free. And you know? I was I was so hurt from my childhood that into my adulthood, other than my husband and children, nobody better approach me for a hug. Oh, I would just like oh, back up. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, and I could not like, you no, you do. Uh, you don't come near me, you know, like back. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, even though we can live a normal life, we can still have those wounds in us. And yeah. then something well, happened sure. and, and it can all come out about again in a horrible, in a horrible way. And yeah, we will have a lot yeah. to learn. Uh, you know, everybody's so competitive oh. and got the eye on the ball of money. Oh. The money ball, uh, you know, and that well, you know, money, money, I hate to say it, but, um, you know, <laughs> what made me think about money, okay, was when I looked at Jesus and I thought this is the king of kings, you know, mm -hmm. but he's not dressed in gold or he's not dressed in, he doesn't have a crown on his yeah, head. Yeah, that potato or, sack he's wearing. He's, he's wearing a clothing that it was similar to a potato sack and, mm -hmm. and a, just a rope around his waist and sandals. A very popular indie ear that I know. Her story, her NDE is all elaborate about all this expensive stuff and suits and beautiful ball gowns and beautiful everything and expensive this and that. And I'm thinking, uh-uh, I don't no. think so. I went there. No. I don't think so. No, I saw it. I mean, don't get me wrong, the, the people that I met in heaven that were my family that had passed on and friends as well, um, they were just dressed like they would have been 
-hmm. here on earth. Now the mansion, the the gates and the castles or what you know, whatever, the the heaven, yeah, I do believe those, you know, when they describe yeah, I it. Too. I mean, because God says I prepared a mansion. He didn't say I prepared a shack for you. Right. He says I prepared a mansion, and I believe heaven right. is the most beautiful. And of oh, course, the is. buildings and structures are gonna and the streets I, they say are lined with gold and glass and I, I've rubies. Never, and, I, I didn't get to see that. I was out in a field. And that's what I, that's, that's the thing. That's what most people see though, is the field and the flowers. Flowers yeah, seems that, to be a common thing. That's what I saw. And uh, the sky is what took me aback too, was yeah. the colors. I'd never seen colors like that. And uh, it made me think of how insignificant. I mean, we're all significant. I don't want to make it sound like we don't have a reason to be here because we all do. But we're just a tiny, tiny, we're just a tiny speck of sand in a universe that is as big as the beach and go and growing constantly. And, you know, I hear these scientists say big, the big bang theory. And I thought, yeah, you know, there was a, originally a big bang and that's when God created the universe. That was your big bang right there. And, you know, I don't know if there's other worlds out there that have people like us on it. I don't, I didn't ask those questions when I, don't I was. I don't think it's any of our business. But it's Obviously really we're isn't. separated for a reason. You yeah. know, just like the living and dead are separated. And these planets are separate. Obviously, obviously it's for a reason. And sometimes we just got to right. accept this is God's plan for us. I exactly. Think. And I, I. Uh, Imagine I all the know. money that would go for the homeless and the sick people and stuff, people dying without medical insurance, if they all that money they have spent on, we don't want to discuss wars for one thing, but, you know, space exploration. Yeah. What about here? What, you know, what's that saying about charity begins a home? You know, you take it care does. of your own and, before you start. Well, I mean, I, I, I understand that to ward off evil, they have to have a military budget. I get that. But at the same time, I think yeah. what they could I think I think there needs to be a lot more diplomacy. I call it diplomacy with love. Yeah, love we have to intent. protect ourselves. Yeah, we do. Love a love with intent. Mm -hmm. You know, if I if I'm a if I'm a politician and I'm stuck in front of one of these guys who 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 as I mentioned, who is hell bent on doing something that's evil to another country or invading another country or I'm going to tell them, look, you know, you don't need to do this. You really there's don't. There's lines that can't be crossed. Yeah. Yeah. There's don't, please don't do this. These people love you. I love you. You know, learn to love one another. Yeah. You know, these yeah. things are, and you know, Jesus, when he comes back, um, he's going to teach them everyone that to learn to love one another, but he's not happy. He's not happy with all the hate that's in the world right now. Yeah. And we can only do what we can do. You know, I just have a little podcast and well, I'm just you know a, I mean? I'm I'm just a tiny wheel in a big cog and I'm trying to, you know, talk, get my message out to everyone that'll listen. Right. To to love one another and to take care of one another and, and to tell lift me each again other up. what Jesus told you about going people being sent back. Well, he he sent me back, but he said um, to me, he said, you know, I'm sending you back because the world's in trouble. He said, there's too much hate. And I want you to teach love, the love I have for everyone in the world. I want you to teach that love, that unconditional love. He said, that's the love of a child. When a child comes to me, that innocent love. Yeah. And look how children and are so mistreated today. Yeah, you know? I know. It's sad. And, but and, again, and, I, and that's the, the I believe the whole message, you know, a king was born as a baby, you know, right? The whole story of Jesus that we have, you know, he come as a baby. And to me, that gives us the feeling cherish these babies, because we don't know what they have been sent to the world to do. Look what Jesus did. You know, well, and Mary what, is a you know unwed mother today. Jesus was born in a stable. Right. But, you know, you think about it. If Mary was an unwed mother today. 
Oh, I know. You know? Yeah, I know. And especially if she was running around saying that, you know, yeah. she was never impregnated. Yeah. I mean, so, why would people, how would people reach out to that? I mean, they would be saying she's nuts, you know, yeah. she, she needs mental help. But I'm just saying, also, there's the, what, another thing that since I've been back that, that I've thought about a lot over the holidays was the Magi. And when they visited Jesus in the stable and how they understood by, through God that this was his son and that God put that into their heart and they were able to give him, lay down gifts to this child beautiful expensive gifts to this child because that's the only way they knew how to honor him mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of things we can do to lay down gifts for jesus to honor him right. you know um, right. calling up an enemy and say let's stop fighting you know whatever right. it is that we can do to to just well, spread the love and get rid of hate in the it, world it's interesting you say that because when i prior to me going to heaven, I didn't really have a good relationship with my older brother and my second oldest sister. And since I've been back, that has all changed. I tell yeah. them now that I, every chance I get that I love them and that they mean so much to me. Yeah. And, then and, yeah, I, and there's which, people's going to close doors on us, you know, they'll block our number. They'll, you know, they're, yeah. that they're, they're closed off. There's nothing you can do about that, you right. know, but, right. but we can, we can try. So I and appreciate I, everything. I mean, I just love your story and I'm so happy to and honored to be able to put it out there for everyone well, to hear you. this, because this is the kind of stories I love, <laughs> you know? Well, well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come on here and spread the love of Jesus Christ and spread the love to everyone and let them know that if they ever need a hug, if they never need to be lifted up, I'm here. All you got to do is give me a call. If you're feeling down, whatever the case may be, if you're suicidal, it doesn't matter to me. I'll, I'll turn that around through the love of Jesus. I'll help you. Okay. Um, send me that <clears throat> picture of Jesus you found that looked like him. Yes. And uh, I have a question about that too. Um, sure. As soon as we're done here. Okay. I will send it to your, uh, uh, I'll send it through Messenger if that's okay. That's fine. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, it's the same guy. Uh, I, I mean, it just <laughs> took me aback because there he was, you know. And I was like, oh my God, that's him, you know. <laughs> I mean, it just blew yeah. me away. Yeah, I say so, we're, we're we're given confirmations because yeah, well, that's you know if we're going to be I messengers, mean, you know, we were there and we could come back and be eyewitnesses for Jesus <clears throat> that heaven right. is real. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, we're going to be getting convers these, um, what I say, confirmations if we look right. for them. If we just push well, you know, that in the back and say, I don't think that, I don't want to talk about it. That doesn't make sense. Right. I don't know if it was real. You know what I mean? We may not, we may miss the boat there. Well, I told you I was an artist and I'm, I'm trying to do a painting right now, but I, I can't do the glory of his wings. But I'm trying to do a painting of that Michael and I, I can't come up with the colors I can't come up with the colors of heaven or anything. I just can't come up with those because those are colors I've never seen before. And I've tried to mix the paints to Trent to make those colors. Not, it's not happening. Those things are earthly things Yeah. up there. It's a whole, different I wish world. I could, I, 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 cause my visions are so clear of things I've seen and I have no talent and I would love to be able to put it down on paper. Right. or in a video and say this is what i saw exactly but i can't do it right and i i i'm gonna try you know to at least do maybe the i can't do the flowers because again the flowers were colors i had never seen before okay. well the if you do were... if you do let me know yeah like, i will I'll, show... I'll, I'll uh show a picture of uh i'll do okay. the best i can to do a painting of michael okay. um but amazing thing to me is is that uh, everyone is smiling, everyone is content, everyone's laughing. It's nothing but love and contentment in heaven. It's a and it they're all a big happy family up there, and and Jesus is right among them, you know. 
And that's the amazing part about that place. It's just, it, it just took me aback. And, you know, the time here is much different than the time in that realm. I mean, what could be six hours here or eight hours here might be a minute there, or what may be, may be six or eight hours there might be two or three seconds here, if that makes any sense. Yeah. There's no, yeah. there's no way to engage that. Yeah, um, I think all of us in the ears have experienced that difference in time there. It's so. kind of, that's, I guess, I, well, I'd be amiss, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that to folks, that there's no equivalent between each realm. They're much different. And, okay. I, and again, I want to emphasize that I did not want to leave. Right. I did not want to leave, but I had no choice because Jesus said, you're going back. Yeah. And what Jesus says, hey, <laughs> I'm, uh, that's okay. it. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I was on my way, you know, but I'm back now and I'm here to spread the good word that Jesus loves everyone and to love one another, to pray for your enemies, to hug one another. Jesus is going to come back. I don't know if we, when he's going to come back, but he will be back. And when he comes back, he's going to come back and we're all going to be much the better for it. So thank you. In, in the meantime, let's learn to love. Okay. That's the thank key. You. All right. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome and God bless you. Take care of yourself and God bless your family. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.